This is Joe McCarthy at Delphic Laboratories. Thank you for joining us today for this free webinar uh, for some updates on the ingredient disclosure regulations uh, out of New York and California. The three things uh, I want to discuss with you today are an update on the uh, New York DAC uh, um, product information disclosure program. There was a uh, New York Supreme Court ruling um, two weeks ago that has effectively struck this law down. Um, the second item I want to review with everyone are the designated lists for the California Clean Product Night Right to Know Act. Um, but what those lists are, where the lists, uh, where are the lists, and um, some tips and um, challenges in navigating those lists. And to finish out the presentation, and show you a simple way that we've derived to be able to search all the lists uh, quickly as well. So a brief history on the New York DEC and the Supreme Court ruling. In uh, June of 2018, uh, New York DEC published their policy on the Household Clean Product Information Disclosure Program under the authority of Article 35 of the Environmental Conservation Law and Part 659 of Title VI of the New York Code of uh, Rules and Regulations. The Environmental Conservation Law and the regulations that go with it have been on the books since the 70s and largely forgotten about until um, last year when this policy document came out. The disclosure requirements were fairly onerous compared to what um, most of industry was already doing. If you're uh, a member of uh, the Household and Commercial Products Association, you were all already voluntarily disclosing ingredients and what the California rule was going to require people starting in January of 2020. Unfortunately, they didn't really engage their stakeholders and there wasn't much opportunity for uh, industry or other um, interested parties to engage them. The HCPA and the American Cleaning Institute tried to communicate with them. They weren't having much luck and felt their only recourse was actually to file suit. And that's what they did in November of 2018. And the suit was more or less based on the argument that uh, New York State did not have the legislative authority to bring out this new rule. It didn't follow their own procedures or legislation. In May of 2019, and as a result of that story, the compliance deadline got pushed off from July 1st, 2019 to October 1st, 2019. But then in May 2019, in our, or sorry, mediation between the Attorney General of New York and the HCPA and HCI, the New York DAC agreed to withdraw their motion to dismiss the case. They were asserting that the industry associations did not have standing and therefore could not bring a case to court as long as the court would rule on whether those parties had standing. And so they pushed off the compliance deadline again until January 19, so a little more than six months from now. But then late August, the New York Supreme Court came down with a ruling and they struck down the New York DAC Household Privacy Product Information Disclosure Program. There are four key findings in their judgment. The, the first one was that the court ruled that the industry associations, the HCPA and ACI, do in fact have standing because their members would suffer injury, in fact, as a result of the challenge agency, what New York DAC was trying to do, and their members were well within the zone of interest. That's important because if the court had found that the uh, associations have standing, then they would not have to rule on whether the uh, household ingredients disclosure program was a guideline or actually a rule. The court also addressed whether uh, the four NGOs, Clean and Health in New York, the New York Committee for Occupational Health and Safety, and We Act for Environmental Justice, whether they had intervener status or can act as a uh, amicus curiae, which is friend of the court, on this regulation. And uh, the court felt that there was no indication that the interests of those proposed interveners was not adequately protected by the parties already involved, specifically the Attorney General of, uh, of New York. And that the outcome did not have a, a substantial um, interest uh, in, in um, or outcome for their point of view, especially because they don't make products. They were not organizations that would have to comply with the regulations for in, in, in posting that on the website. 
The third ruling was the New York DEX defense was that the disclosure program was a guideline for the existing environmental conservation law, not a regulation, and therefore was not subject to the formal rulemaking process. The court found that the policy, in fact, did constitute a clear rule and was not a mere interpretive statement because of the very detailed and specific requirements, but not insignificant requirements. So the ruling uh, actually addressed you know, the potential cost of compliance with that. And the fourth part was because the disclosure program actually constitutes a rule, New York State follow the State Administrative Procedure Act uh, is what required when they introduce new rules. So proposed rulemaking, uh, engagement with stakeholders, public meetings, uh, debates in, in the House and in the Senate. So there's four possibilities going forward now that this law has been struck down. So as of now, that, that law is, uh, quote, null and void. It has no force and effect. You don't have to comply with it. You don't have to put in your certification forms to uh, New York DAC. It's interesting that New York DAC has not updated their website to reflect this. Uh, we do have a copy of the court ruling, and that's not in dispute. But the four things they can do is New York DEC could appeal the ruling. And that could take uh, a little over a year. It's possible that we, the, uh, the lawyers with HCPA feel it's unlikely that New York DEC could also file for a stay of the existing court ruling, which means the disclosure program would still go into effect January 1st, 2020, pending the appeal. And the second option is New York DEC could go through the proper rulemaking process. This would be a brand new rule and all the things that go with it, and that's likely to take a year or more. Um, and keep in mind, we're going to an election cycle in 2020. That might not be at the top of the list for um, people trying to get reelected. The third option is that New York DEC can ask the legislator and the governor to pass a law granting them the authority to make the disclosure program law. Part of that, though, is they would have to prove there's an immediate need, an urgent uh, reason to do this. And because of the, the uh, underlying law and rule have been on the books since the 1970s and no one's done anything about it for almost 40 years, what would be the urgency to this? It'd be hard to make that case to, to go to that extreme option. And the fourth thing, of course, is they could do nothing. They could just let it die and, and not come back and try to make a new rule. There has been some talk about uh, trying to get a federal rule or federal law going because that would preempt any state rules that were not already existing. But similar to this, you're heading into the election cycle for 2020. Is this an issue that you would be able to find politicians uh, to support and champion at this point? So uh, I think it's unlikely we would see something at the, uh, the federal level, either through the CPSC or, or EPA. So what does that mean for you as manufacturers or distributors of cleaning products in New York State? If that program is defunct as of now. You don't have to be uh, getting any preparation for your online disclosure and all the extra information that they wanted. And you don't have to submit the uh, information disclosure certification form, uh, which also required uh, endorsement and signing by a senior company official. So that's very good news. Uh, the HCPA has done very good work with that, um, trying to engage New York State and in, in bringing this to bringing this court and engaging their membership that you know, some, some companies were able to put uh, affidavits in um, demonstrating that they would in fact uh, be impacted and perhaps uh, undo harm from the regulation. So there's an actual cause and effect on that one. But we still have the Republic of California. The California Clean Product Right to Know Act, it's uh, not being challenged and it's not going away. This is one that your first deadline for online website disclosure is January 1st, 2020. So as of today, you've got 103 days left to be able to review all your um, formulations and find out what disclosure you need on your website. And then there's requirements for on-product label disclosure a year later, January 1st, 2020, 2021. So I think that 103 days is key because uh, the question I would ask is when do you need to get content to your webmaster to make sure that you could get a website updated or up and running to meet this deadline? So the California Clean Product Right to Know Act uh, refers to designated lists. And these designated lists are important because 
you need to disclose on the product label any intentionally added ingredient that is included on a designated list. And on your website, you have to um, include a, a list of the ingredients along with a cast number for the ingredients, the function of the ingredients, and whether those ingredients are uh, on one of these designated lists. We also want a list of all fragrance ingredients that are on a designated list. So you need to know what the lists are and where to find them to comply with what these requirements will be. So what are the designated lists? There's 22 lists that are defined under section 108952G, but there's actually 23 lists because the 23rd list are the EU fragrance allergens. While they're not included under 108952G, they are cited in 22 different places that require you to list on the label if that's an EU fragrance allergen and list on the website. If you don't have that on the label, you have to have a statement that it contains fragrance allergens. But on the website, you still would have to disclose those individual fragrance allergens. You can list a fragrance simply as fragrance, but if it has US fragrance allergens and components, you're gonna to have to separate those out. You don't have to give concentration. You do have to tell people there. So I'll point out the names on this slide are summaries only of the different lists. Uh, that's just a general title. Uh, the definition in the act actually includes a lot of qualifiers. So not every ingredient on one of the list, the, the, the uh, root list, is necessarily one that needs to be disclosed. Uh, for example, the uh, European Union uh, carcinogen, mutagen, reproductive toxins are limited to category 1A and 1B. You don't include the category two uh, carcinogen mutagens or reproductive toxins. So that would not need to go on your label or your website. Similarly, for the IR carcinogens, they're only concerned about categories 1A, 2, and 2B, uh, but not category three. And if you go to the IR website, of course, it's gonna show you uh, all those ratings. Well, we're gonna explore that a bit more later in this presentation when we discuss a bit about navigating the list and some of the challenges you're gonna find with that. So where are the designated lists? Well, California has uh, defined what the lists are. The uh, SB258, uh, the California Clean Products Directive No Act, doesn't tell you where they are. But so here's three sources. One is the California Department of Toxic Substance Control authoritative list. They have each list and they have a PDF to download, but you'll have to look at those dates of the PDF. Some of them may be stale dated. Some are three months old, some are two years old, and we're gonna see that in the demonstration shortly. And a lot of the lists will include ingredients that are outside of the definition. Again, the example is the EU carcinogen mutagens of reproductive toxins, or the EU candidate of substances of very high concern. For California, they only want the substances that are uh, on the basis of uh, Article 57F of the EU regulations. When we see the list, there's going to be substances included on the basis of other articles. So your challenge is how are you going to separate out the ingredients that apply to the California regulation from what's in the entire list? Uh, another example we're gonna see here is the Canadian persistent biocumulative and inherently toxic uh, the link that they send you to is a circular link. You won't find the list because Environment Canada took it down and California has not updated the link to that where you could find them. There's also a couple of dead links that we might show you. So the first list that you are to find these things, this is the uh, California authoritative list. Um, part of the structure we'll show you here where they have the name of the list at Prop 65. This first hyperlink here, this will be a PDF copy. And if we open that, we can look at the date that they last updated it. So March 8th uh, of this year. Has Prop 65 changed in the last six months? I don't know. Uh, I pref it might have. Uh, of course, we've all subscribed to the Prop 65 email, so you'll get notices when these things change. So I not inclined to use these PDFs because I don't know that they're up to date. They will have a link on the bottom half of that section. And if you open that up, it will take you directly to the Prop 65 website. There's another option to download the entire list as of September 13th. So clearly it's been updated between March and now, and you have a, an option of a PDF or Excel or a separated file. 
if we were to go to the EU um, annex of carcinogens and mutagens or reproductive toxins, similarly, the PDF copy at the very top, you can see it was downloaded 06, 03, 19. That's likely March 6, 2019. Again, my concern would be, is that the most up-to-date copy? The guidance at the bottom here is you could go to the uh, European Chemical Agency's uh, Chemical Labeling for a Database and then select Health Hazards and do a search. So if we go there, this is where the link takes you. And you get a list of cast numbers. And we'll show that's one page out of 2,900. How do we know which one of these are carcinogens, mutagens, or reproductive toxins? Unless you've had some experience with the ECHA database, you wouldn't necessarily know that if you click on this link, you can perform a search. And you can click on the health, and then you select, select what we're looking for. We're looking for category 1A and B carcinogens, The 1A and B mutagens, and the 1A and B reproductive toxins. So you can select your search functions, and then we press search. And it comes back with a list of nine chemicals. That seems like a small list to me. And part of this is understanding the structure of these database and how they use them. So if we were to click back and look at this inventory again, there's a Boolean operator here. So when we selected uh, the CAT 1A and 1B carcinogen, mutagen, reproductive toxins, when we select and, it is searching for the chemicals that meet all six of those criteria, which doesn't make sense to me because you're either a, uh, 1A or 1B, you can't be both. So what you would have to do is change your Boolean operator to OR. So we're searching for chemicals that have one of those uh, classifications, not all of them. And then we search. And we get a much longer list. Turns out it is about 4,300 uh, Chemicals, that makes a little bit more sense to me. Except when you look at the very top, what's at our first hit? It's hydrogen. And I've never known hydrogen to be a carcinogen, a mutagen, or a reproductive toxin. So why is it on this list? You got to remember this is the um, uh, European Chemical Agency list of notifications under reach. So if you click on those reach classifications, so we could see that, you know, 300, 600, 700, 800 different notifiers, notified hydrogen as being a flammable gas. If we scroll down, you're gonna find one notifier notified as being a mutagen or carcinogen. Um, I think we all know that hydrogen is neither of those. So that's part of the challenge when, if you were to do a search here is um, understanding where this information is coming from. It, it, it becomes a bit of a um, wild goose chase to try to look at all these things. You know, hydrogen is an obvious one, but would you go to all these other lists? Um, you can, at the very end of it, I believe, export this as an Excel or CDS file. Um, and that might be a little easier to search your individual cast members. I had mentioned that they have Kennedy uh, list for um, Bicumid persistent inherently toxic. Uh, they don't have a date on this one when it was downloaded. You could use this, but again, this is a PDF, so I don't find that is uh, very user friendly when you're trying to search for things. Um, you would end up doing this one at a time. If you go to the source link that they are recommending to, you get this page. which talks about the categorization, categorization and screening of the DSL. And this was the Canadian version of REACH that started almost 10 years ago and is um, finally wrapping up. And there's some links down here. So we can look at the overall categorization results. Well, maybe that will give us a list of things that are PBITs. And there's nothing there. 
Um, if we click on the first link, that really just brings us back to the first page that California sent us to. How about the third link, door number three? Well, this just takes you to the DSL substance list. This is the Canadian version of Tosca. So we can search for a pass number. Um, and does that tell us whether that was found to be persistent by someone or highly toxic? It doesn't really. But can you imagine searching this one cast number at a time? But the rest of this, they show you it's a similar uh, structure. They'll have a PDF that may or may not be current. And then they have direct links to each of them. Some of them, unfortunately, um, for example, here's the direct link to the Washington persistent by pulling inherently toxic. And that's a dead link. So now you're stuck trying to find where do I find this page? What you will not find anywhere on this is the fragrance allergens. So they don't provide a link to that. And that's one of the things you have to look for under the uh, California Clean Product Right to Know is whether you have fragrance components that are listed as fragrance allergens on the EU cosmetic regulations. So where would you be finding that? Well, one option is you could go back to the New York State list. This is Appendix B of the uh, New York State um, Household Clean Products Information Disclosure Guideline. Um, they also have direct links most of these lists are identical to what's in California. They're going to take you to the same page, but these are direct to the source. They haven't summarized it. Um, so if we go to the EU fragrance allergens. What it actually does is take you to the actual uh, uh, European Union cosmetic regulations. Part of your challenge here is we will not find the term fragrance allergen anywhere in this document. Uh, we know what we're looking for the ones in Annex 3. And Annex 3 is simply a list of substances and cosmetics which uh, are subject to restrictions that are laid down. So here we can look at an ingredient Say the first one is boric acid, it gives you the name, the cast number, the European uh, uh, EC number, uh, where it's used, maximum concentrations, any restrictions and labor requirements. But again, it doesn't tell you whether something's a fragrance or not. So if we have something that I know is a fragrance, say like uh, linalool, yes, it's in, uh, in the Annex 3 of the cosmetic regulations is a fragrance ingredient. But this is our trick and egg question. You would have to know that little was a fragrance ingredient, um, uh, or it was a fragrance allergen, and then go look for it. So I don't think that this link is very um, useful for anybody. Your third option, though, is the Household and Commercial Products Association list of list matrix. This is a uh, open source web page. You do not have to be a member to access it. And what they've done is taken the various designated lists and they cross reference them against which regulation is citing them. So we have the California Clean Product Right to Know, uh, New York DEC, which we're not interested in anymore, and there's some uh, Walmart guidelines as well. So we could go to this one and find the EU fragrance allergens. And they have the they have the link as well. One of the differences you'll find here is uh, where a lot of the California links uh, and uh, New York links will take you to the home page of a certain organization.
the links on the HCPA will take you to the actual relevant page. So if we were looking for iris carcinogens um, or uh, iris, uh, iris toxicants that have a um, An exposure uh, uh, reference dose. You can look here, part of it, your similar challenges. This is not a complete list. You simply want to export that. You have to know how to use your filters. Um, if you look at this though, the default page has musculoskeleton. Already checked, you would have to take that off. If we're looking for the cancer, you uncheck that. Now you click cancer. And now you're getting 151 records instead of just the six. Uh, you get the name, you get the cast number, but similarly as an HTML, this doesn't make things easy for you to search. Um, you can't export your results to Excel. Um, if we're looking for the uh, non-cancer substances that have uh, reference uh, doses, again, we'd have to come down here and check those two, and we'll update the data set for you. And now we have 494 records. And similarly, it's an Excel file. You can scroll through, um, or you could, or sorry, it's a HTML. You could scroll through, but then you might have to export it to make it easier for yourself. So just from this little demonstration, I'm thinking, you know, it would probably take, optimistically, one to two minutes to search each of the 23 different lists for a single cast number. So you're looking at, you know, maybe 45 minutes to an hour to look up one cast number. So how many cast numbers do you have in your formulary? Do you have 50, do you have 100? Now you're looking at 50 or 100 hours of searching. That's eight hours a day, every day for one to two weeks. Um, is that 103 day deadline looking realistic for you? Wouldn't it be nice if you could just paste a cast number or a list of cast numbers into an Excel file and have it search all 23 lists for you at the same time and highlight what the hits are? And that's what we've created. So Dell Tech, because we had the same challenges we just demonstrated with you, that you have to find these lists, then you have to learn the structure of the list. Um, in the case of regulations, look at the regulations and try to mine out the specific uh, few uh, chemicals or customs that are in there, and then start searching uh, based on what your formula is or your, your entire, entire stable of formulas. Uh, and that takes a lot of time. So what we decided, we're not going to do it that way. We took all the lists. We converted everything from either a PDF or an HTML or you know, a common separated file, made it into a um, Excel-based cast number um, database. So you have a common entry point, a common data point you can put in, and you can search everything at once. So for example, if we want to put in a cast number, we'll start with uh, Greener Hydrogen was showing up on the EU list, and it doesn't really make sense why. Well, we can put that in, and it's not showing up in the list. Uh, we've done a couple of things on this Excel file. Here in column B, we've put in a function to check, is that a valid cast number at all? Um, so you don't waste your time. Sometimes there's a typo, or if you have a, a bad thumb, um, you put the wrong cast number in, um, and you won't necessarily know, but we have a logic function that will tell you that's not a valid format. Gives you the name. We'll give you the function of the ingredient as well. That's one of the things you're going to have to disclose. Is it a, is a solvent? Is it a, a surfactant, chelate, that sort of thing? And what we're going to find here is, in fact, hydrogen is not on any of the list. Uh, it would have highlighted red if it was. Uh, to give you an example of that, uh, we could put in some more cast numbers, like uh, two detoxy ethanol. You see how it highlights uh, the Teltis is on a list, so we know it's a valid class number. I know what the common name is, um, so you can save yourself some, some room on the label. Um, depending on how uh, you don't want to use a new pack name, it gives a function, and we know it's on a list, so we can scroll over and which list is it on. What's well, on the um, uh, OEHA uh, uh, reference toxins list, and that's just the one there. Well, we could look at other ones. Uh, say we have a uh, solvent and or fragrance and uh, what you're gonna use this one for in your product. You 
delimining, so it could be a solvent, it could be a fragrance component. It's highlighted that's on at least one list. You scroll over and found yes, in fact, delimining is an EU fragrance allergen. You're going to have to call that out specifically on your website or on the label. Um, you can put them in at one at a time. It would also be convenient if you wanted to have an entire list of task numbers. So you could simply you, you, you select your database and you copy and paste. And automatically we'll search. So we've just searched uh, roughly 20 ingredients with the click of a button and we're getting um, the common names that we would want to use, what the function is, and whether something is on the list or not. Now we have an oxenol, um, you know, which is a non phenol phosphate. It's only showing up on that button list. Actually, it's showing up on this off-star priority action, um, which if you go to that source, it's a scanned PDF of a policy document. You would have to read that manually. So if you think that's something that might make your life easier, uh, what we can do is provide you with a, a custom simple search tool. Uh, if you were to provide us with uh, a list of the customers in your products, we can make a, a custom search tool for your formula. We wouldn't need to know which product the ingredient is in. We don't know what the constant, don't need to know what the concentration is. Um, if we have an example here, it'll give you two things. The first one could be a complete review of all the ingredients. This one at this time, we've only got it set up for 100 ingredients, but of course, that's expandable. We could do it for 200, 500 ingredients. So we'll highlight whether the ingredient is on any list, then tell you which list it's on. Uh, another option, you know, because that's your universal view, if you want to look at a specific formula, you can just copy and paste in the ingredients in that formula. And now we can look at that and say, okay, that particular formula, this was a random example, there was nothing uh, on any of the designated lists. So all you really would have to do for your disclosure is list the ingredients by the common name. Uh, the other thing we do is also give you a cross-reference of what the California reference is for the designated list and the regulation, uh, what the New York was, and what the links, and these are not the links that California was giving you. These are the links uh, that go to the correct location. Uh, there's no dead links here. And you need these because on your website, if ingredient is included on a designated list, you have to provide the link to that designated list. Um, purportedly because customers might want to go and look. Um, I, I would be a little surprised uh, and maybe a little impressed at the same time that the person of the general public wants to go and try to navigate one of these lists and decide what that means for them. If you were to do this, um, there's some things you should think about uh, when you provide the list of cast numbers. Uh, with raw materials, attention to detail, detail would be critical. Uh, most ethoxylated uh, alcohols would have trace amounts of ethylene oxide or 1,4-dioxane. Not all supplier SDSs would disclose these necessarily. That doesn't mean it's not in your product. Uh, most EDTA solutions, depending on which grade you're getting, would have NTA. Um, so it's going to be really necessary for you to drill down to your raw material specifications to make sure that you're actually capturing all the ingredients that are actually ending up in your product. Uh, with fragrances, that could be a challenge to get full disclosure from a lot of the fragrance houses. They don't want to tell you everything that's in it. Um, at a minimum, they should be able to tell you whether any of the um, ingredients are on any of the 23 designated uh, list or whether it contains any of the EU fragrance allergens. Um, and if uh, they're not, they don't have to tell you everything that's in there. Uh, and then you can just... Um, Disclose the fragrance as fragrance on your label and on your website. You don't have to say the specific brand name or the component. Um, some limitations to this tool, it only works with a cast number search. It doesn't work with text or say a class of compounds. So categories like nickel compound or mercury compound or similar, and that's are listed on Prop 65 like that, or the California air contaminants, 
uh, California non-transfer hazards won't be found with the search tool. Um, but if you're using something like nickel compounds, you're probably aware of how they're listed on things like Prop 65. And largely, this will be types of um, uh, ingredients and chemicals that really just aren't going to show up in a cleaning product. They, you know, they, they have no use. If you're interested in getting this uh, Excel-based uh, search tool uh, specific to your products or your formulary uh, database, uh, give me a call or send me an email and we'll see what we can do for you.